Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another segment of The Last Word. I'm Dan Roberts, the publisher of The Vegas Voice, and our goal is to introduce you to all the people running for elected office in the upcoming election. We're very lucky today to have a very special guest, and that is Judge Ellie Rohani, who is a district court judge. Judge, I thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know what? Most people really don't know what a judge does, except when they wear the black robe and <laughs> there's a problem. But let's start with your background. Tell us a little bit about you, your experience, your background. How did you become a judge? Sure. So I, I always tell people that my story didn't start with me. It started with my parents. My parents left Iran after the Iranian Revolution and the hostage crisis because um, the new Islamic regime was um, rounding up and executing Baha'is, which is my parents' faith and my faith. My parents left Iran uh, and landed in Pakistan, which is where I was born, until they could receive asylum here in Las Vegas. My uncles were living here. My, one of my uncles was a heart surgeon. The other one was doing commercial real estate development. So we moved here. We lived in a studio one, one bedroom uh, apartment with my uncle. Uh, he gave us the bedroom and he slept on the couch, so he's my hero. Right. Um, but I grew up here in Las Vegas I, since I was a year old. I was raised in the Clark County public school system. I went to Clark High School. I went to UNLV for undergrad and UNLV for law school. One of the things that was really drilled into me, and I think this informs why I wanted to be a judge, is because of the situation that my parents came from, from a country that didn't value them as citizens and didn't recognize them and they had no rights, um, my parents always told me the United States is the best country in the world. And I really do believe that because we came from a country where we had nothing. We, they were rounding us up and executing us. Um, it's because of that that I dedicated my career to public service. Yeah, and so, I mean, the real American dream of- Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a really, when you think about it, I'm a young brown immigrant girl right. who wouldn't have even been able to be educated in the country that she came from. And now I'm a sitting judge. It's, an, it's incredible. It's an incredible story. Um, but I think it's an incredible symbol of what Las Vegas in particular brings um, to the United States. You know, and with that type of background, the temperament, when you're sitting on that bench and you have that black robe mm -hmm. on, can you see people in a different light than maybe most people can? Yes, and I think it's, it's before, and before I became, right before I became a judge, I was a federal prosecutor and I prosecuted child sex crimes for almost six years. Um, very difficult cases, as oh, you can imagine. Be. So when you've seen the worst of the worst, in those cases, you've seen true harm, trauma, difficulty, I mean, what the definition of PTSD should be, but you've also seen the hope that can come from applying yourself, I take all that into consideration. Every time I get up on the bench in the black robe that I will tell you is very hot, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Your hands and feet will be freezing, but your whole body will be burning up because of that robe. But it's, it's, it's a tremendous responsibility, but you need a breadth of experience to be able to bring good judgment. Uh, and as a judge, District Court, Department 11, what's your area there? Is it criminal? Is it civil? What, it, what do you cover? So Department 11 is a mixed docket, so it's 60% civil and 40% criminal. In civil cases, I preside on any disputed matter over $15,000, um, it can come to district court. So a lot of car accidents, real property disputes, medical malpractice, um, other types of contract disputes, those are the type of civil things that I see. I don't do any family law. Mm -hmm. um, probate is, is very limited. It's usually the, the sign off on the probate court stuff. So not a lot of probate, um, but very, limited in terms of civil and it's not business court which is a different designation there's only a few judges who do business court mm -hmm. currently criminal i do everything except for first degree murder so if it's death penalty eligible it's handled by our homicide team of judges i'm not on that team i don't want to be on that team right. i feel like i've seen a little bit of uh well too much of bad stuff for a little while i think i need a break from it but i would preside over everything else so felonies and gross misdemeanors would come to district court so I mean, you would get a domestic abuse. You would, sure. uh, you would get a burglary. You would get absolutely. And then, when after there's a trial, and, and if the, assuming a defendant is found guilty, I mean, you have that awesome responsibility of saying, okay, yeah. what do I do with this person, male or female? Yeah. Because like, you can take him away. You can separate him from his family, her family. Right. 
What's the criteria? How do you look at it? Because that's an awesome responsibility. It, it's, it's the most difficult decision that I have to make is sentencing an individual. And I, it's my responsibility to take several things into consideration. The first is, and I think coming from a background where I was advocating for victims, is I obviously consider the victim's perspective. And I put tremendous weight in that for two reasons. I dealt largely with child victims who we as a society tend to not listen to their voices. We want to just vindicate them because what was done to them was terrible. Sure. But it's important for children to also have a voice. And so I listen to the victims and I take into consideration what they want and how they feel. But I have to look at the human being who's standing in front of me. What was the sum of experiences that got this person to this point? I have to look at the thing that they did. Um, there has to be consequences for our actions. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and I, when they do something wrong, they get put in timeout. Yeah. So if an adult does yeah. something wrong, they should get a timeout too. Um, so there have to be consequences for their actions. But my number one consideration is, how do I fix the problem? The sad reality is in Nevada, the number one mental health facility in the state of Nevada is the Clark County Detention Center. The number one substance abuse detoxification facility is the Clark County Detention Center. We have a tremendous, tremendous mental health and substance abuse pandemic in Las Vegas. And the reality is a lot of our crime is fueled by mental health and substance abuse problems. My responsibility is to make sure that this never happens again. My responsibility is to make sure that this community is safe. So I balance the need for punishment with the need to just fix the problem. And so I look at, are there services that we can provide as a community to rehabilitate this person so nobody else becomes a victim mm -hmm. of this person in the future? And if the answer to that is no, and like some people, they're not ready to change. That, that's the way I look at it. Uh, you have to be ready to put in the work, the hard work to change who you are. And I, uh, if they've wasted all those opportunities, they might get more of a consequence from mm -hmm. you, right? Yeah. And Going back about, on your experience, again, coming <clears throat> as an immigrant with women that are not even considered as people half the time, I would yeah, say. Yeah, no, that's right. And then you work your way up. <coughs> you're, a, uh, you're a professor at... Uh, I was. And when you, when you see these young people coming up hoping to one day appear before you, do they look at your wild eye and, and are they idealistic or are they looking at, look, I'm just going to make a buck. There's both. There's yeah. both. Um, I will say that I have been quite. I, I I was a professor at UNLV at the law school, mm -hmm. and I taught legal writing there in the number one legal writing program in the country. We're very proud of that fact. I think we should celebrate that fact. Yeah. Legal writing is the thing that lawyers do, right? Right. Um, I would say that the majority of students who come out of UNLV, in particular want to make their communities better and serve their communities. And that spirit of service is something that is fostered at the law school, and it's something that was important to me. Some of them want to make money. That's okay, too. I mean, we have student loans. Right. Some people want to make money. That's all right. That, there's nothing wrong with that. But even that is done in a spirit of service, which I appreciate. You know, but, and, and you come out, a local gal coming out here, yeah. uh, going to law school. Your first job when you graduated what, what was it I worked at the law school you worked at the I school. always make the joke that you know I liked it so much they couldn't get rid of me yeah. <laughs> um, no I taught at the law school I helped with bar exam preparation uh, students who needed tutoring I taught an advanced rhetoric and legal analysis class and then subsequently I was a legal writing professor as an adjunct and then you went you went to the prosecutor's office? No, I worked for the federal courts first. Federal courts? Yeah, I worked okay. for a district judge and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So, oh, that's very nice, man. <laughs> that's high up there. Yes. And is it different from law school? I know, I know from law school to the real world, it's, yeah. they are two different worlds. <laughs> right. How are you able to really put it all together so that when you sit on that bench and you look at that defender, you look at the two parties fighting right. in a civil matter, you, you know, you can tell people, I'm fair, I'm, part of, I'm not mm -hmm. partisan, and I listen. How do you go about doing that? Right. Because I mean, that's got to be the hardest part of the job. It, it's the easiest part of the job. Is and it really? here's, here's why. I just have to follow the law. I don't have to have an opinion on whether this law is good or bad. Okay. As a citizen, I can have that opinion, and I can go talk to my legislators, and I can have them change the law or work on it. It's not my job as a judge. My job is to look at the laws as they are written, 
look at how those laws have been interpreted, and apply it without regard to, am I friends with this person? Do I like that person? Are they being mean to each other? And they're always being mean to each other, right? right? Um, I just have to follow the law. That's the easiest part of my job. And that's the way that I believe that we get true justice, is if every judge just applied the law in a faithful way, that would be what true justice looks like. It's because judges, we're human beings, right? We're allowed, you know, we are human beings. We're allowed to make mistakes. Um, I, do, I, I do actively try to put aside my own biases. I do try to check my own biases and what I impl- you know, who I am as a person, of course. People, you know, the people vote for the person that they're, they're, they're voting for the person, right? right? But they have to work on, in my opinion, vote for a person who's willing to work on themselves. And, and I guess that you answered the question about yeah. why should seniors vote for you right. is exactly what you said. Though. Yeah, and I think in particular the two things that I do or that I focus on is the efficient administration of justice, which benefits everybody, especially for, I mean, it's unfortunate reality that it takes a long time for a case to work through the system. Um, but if a judge keeps everybody's feet to the fire, we get to good decisions faster and sooner. So I believe in making decisions and doing it as efficiently as possible. And the other is to keep the community safe. But sometimes keeping the community safe isn't incarcerating somebody. This is what I try to impress on people. Even as a former prosecutor, you have to be able to see that not everybody is so irredeemably broken that we can't fix them. And so if we focus on fixing the issue, we keep the community safe overall. And the few seconds that we have Mm -hmm. left, Judge, if people want more information about you, they want to know all about you, they want to even contribute to your campaign, make sure you stay on as as Judge, how do they go about doing it? Sure. So my website is www.ellie, the number four, judge.com. And they can follow me in the community. I'm on Facebook at Judge Ellie Rohani, District Court Department 11. I'm also on Instagram, at Judge Ro- Ellie Rohani, and on Twitter, at Judge Rohani. You're everywhere, huh? I'm all over the place, and I will tell you, um, in, in, in candor, I don't do my own social media. Okay. <laughs> As you can imagine, yeah. I'm, I'm busy on the bench, and I do try to focus my time on what my job is and the job that I would like to keep. And so um, if, if I, you send me a message, and there, my email is on there, and my phone number is on there, if I don't return it immediately, please rest assured that I'm, yeah. I'm busy meeting out justice, but I will certainly get back to you, or my social media manager will certainly get back to me to get back to you. you Judge, I thank you so much for appearing. We wish you all the best. Thank you. And this is Dan Roberts for The Last Word saying we'll see you again next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judge. Thanks.